Um, so the idea behind this was to look at the runtime memory system of C. So we see down at the low level, deeply embedded, that there's still um, people not having full awareness of what's happening on the target. So we really, and C, like most things, a very simple language. If you get back to the basics, it's actually quite an easy language to comprehend. Uh, so first, a little bit, we, you know, if I think most of you are probably aware of us, you come through the webinar, you know, we've been doing uh, training consultancy specifically in the embedded space uh, for getting on to 24 years now. Um, and much of this information dates back to when we first started uh, within that. Um, so the objective today really is to get a clear definition of the abstract memory model that is common whether you will be programming on, say, a Linux box or Windows box or a deeply embedded. It's the same abstract model. But then very specific to us is what happens when we target that to um, down to a mapping. Sorry, mapping it down to the flash and RAM system associated with that uh, on our particular system. Um, as part of that, we have to look at program startup from power up to main, what's happening behind the, the screens there. And then most importantly is some of the typical issues and problems and how we can mitigate some of those problems associated with our, our system. Um, so we, in programming terms, we quite often use the term variable. C actually doesn't use the term variable in the standard. It talks about a program object. So it's always used this term. And the definition of the standard is that it's a region of data storage in the execution environment, uh, the contents of which can represent values. So this is our runtime data. We think of, we will call them program objects. And you might find during the talk, I might sometimes talk about variables, sometimes talk about objects uh, within that. And most importantly, there, there are two different execution environments in the C standard. Um, one is called a hosted environment. So this assumes you're working in a standard operating system. So Linux, Windows, OS X are our main ones. Um, and there's actually a predefined um, macro within the compiler environment. So all C compilers support this, where you can actually check this. Uh, so double underscore STD, so standard C underscore hosted. If that's equal to one, that means you're uh, compiling um, and actually running on a, uh, sorry, compiling on a for a hosted environment. Typically for the free, what, what's called a freestanding environment, which is our deeply embedded environment, then that value is zero. So from our perspective, we, I'm expecting a program that's going to be freestanding associated uh, with our particular environment. Then is, uh, sorry, in a freestanding environment, um, I'm talking deeply embedded. Uh, here we've got a, a traditional architecture. We've got our core. Uh, which will have a number of supporting registers, supporting the ALU. We'll normally have uh, persistent memory, most commonly now flash, and non-persistent memory, uh, possibly SRAM uh, within our system. And of course, it can be more complex than this. And then finally, we have our IO device up for reference where we, we talk to the outside environment. Our interest, the two left-hand ones, the SRAM and the flash, this is where our program execution generally is going to evolve uh, in our system. So first thing, a couple of terms, and these again, by getting back to these basics of the terms, uh, they help us really dig down to the language. So when we talk about a declaration. Um, so the placement of the declaration defines what we call scope. So scope is very important. So scope is where we have access to program memory. So when we're dealing with these program objects, it must be in scope. If it's not in scope, we'll get it. We'll get an error. Typically, compile time error associated. With so scope is very important within our program, and this is defined across the whole program. The basic scope we talk about is directly is, is, is um, linked to a linkage model. Um, so on the left hand side, we can talk about the idea of declaration. So extern from a data perspective, extern with data. Um, then with the extern directive is basically saying this memory exists in the program somewhere, but is not in this file. So when we want to access program objects outside of your current C file, we have to use it through it through uh, an external directive. This brings a declaration into that particular C file, that, that translation unit. Functions we can do external. We don't need to use external. It's an optional thing for functions. It's not optional for data. And of course, typically, these are going to be managed in header files. But for simplicity, I'm putting it directly in the C files. In terms of C, we have three different scopes we deal with. The default, if something is at file level, so the int ESO, as we see here, is called, called external scope. So we tend to talk about global objects or global variables. That's what the ESO is. It's, it's visible anywhere in the program. If we have an external declaration in that C file, we can access that external data. We also have file-based scope. 
So we talk particularly about internal linkage. If you apply static to data or functions in the C file, then what this is doing is limiting the scope, the, the access to that memory to within that file. So we can only directly get at that memory from that file. So the ISO object here, program that's being defined, it can be accessed within the file, but it cannot be accessed outside the file. And this is also to do with things called symbol tables. And then finally, we have what's called block scope. So in C, we talk about quite often it's called local scope or local variables. But in C, again, it's called block scope. So the curly brackets, brackets represent block uh, within our system. So there are three linkage scope models we have within C, the C model. So the placement of the definition defines the lifetime of the object. The lifetime defines how long that memory is, is actually allocated and used within the program. And C again has three different lifetimes we talk about, uh, static, automatic, and allocated. So the first one is static. So static objects, as we said, have program lifetime. This means that this definition, so global here is a global definition, a static definition. That means that memory will have in our memory system, if we look in something called our map file, we'll see that this has an absolutely allocated address. The address for global will be created and defined during the link stage. And that's fixed during our program run. It will always be exactly the same address within our, our system associated with that. So for all our statics, we know the number of statics we have at compiler link time across all of our C files, all, all our translation units. Um, the automatic objects then, as we said, are block scoped. And the blocks, of course, the outermost block is at the function level. So on the left-hand side, we have int a. This is a typically function-based variable. It's, a, it's a visible through. So it has its definition, this scope within that function. So a is, can be used anywhere within that particular function. Of course, if we have control structures, so in the middle here, we have the for loop, then we can localize uh, any particular program objects to within that control structure. So again, it's actually the block that is associated with the control, control, control structure, excuse me. Um, so the for loop has a single statement, but the statement itself can be a block structure. So in text there again is defined and scoped to that block and can't be accessed. Same goes with C99, it introduced the ability to, to define uh, for example, in the for loop that I is a loop based variable that again has a scope and lifetime of the actual block. And on the far right, we can see that blocks can actually be standalone. They don't have to be associated with control structures. And occasionally this can be used as a scoping mechanism. It's fairly unusual, but it's perfectly legal within the C standard. So again, the variable B, the program object B is de been defined and scoped and its lifetime. So importantly, what we're saying here is when the block ends, then the lifetime of that memory ends. In some way, the system reclaims that memory. It's no longer needed within our system. And the final case we have are what are called, this is fits in with the dynamic memory. We have this concept of stack frames. Uh, so when we have a stack frame, then we typically have one function calling another. And as part of that call model, and this is very architecture specific and compiler specific in the way it works is we create something called a stack frame. Now a stack frame normally is managing the parameter values. So here where we're calling process, a stack frame will be created that will store the values 10 and 20, the, the actual arguments being passed. Uh, it would allow space for the returned out value. This is called an R value that's coming back from process the double. Um, and as part of that model, it will normally have the return address. So the idea is when process is called, it can return back to the core site. So that's our, the concept of a stack frame. And that's allocated on this area called the stack. And what the stack brings is something very important in sort of modern programming is the concept of, uh, concept of recursion. So this is one of the major reasons for the stack is it allows a function to call a function. Now, recursion is not a major part of a lot of programming and actually most coding standards, embedded coding standards ban it, but it's a primary reason for a software stack. So here we've got a simple recursive function called print binary. Uh, it takes an integer value and then we'll output that into that integer value as a binary value. And as part of that model, uh, it's calling itself. So we can see if the whole is not zero, then print binary is called again. Uh, now, the, the local objects, whole and remainder, aren't really needed for this example. They're really here to, to make it obvious of what the core frame is going to be like. So we can see that we, 
each time that until we get down to a zero value till the whole is zero, then we get the recursive model. And on the right hand side, we can see the stack. And in all modern systems, the stack typically grows from high memory to low memory. We talk about pushing onto the stack and popping off the stack. And this involves a stack pointer, and that will move us down the memory from high memory to low memory. So that's how our automatics are typically ma managed. So any local automatics, a new instance of those is created on each iteration of the recursive call. So we use the stack to store our automatics, our local variables. Uh, we also store any parameters and any return values on the stack memory. Um, now, as I mentioned, this is sometimes process specific, or actually it's always process specific and quite often compiler specific. Now, what ARM did, ARM is probably the dominant architecture for the deeply embedded space, the Cortex M family, the, the, v, the V7M and the V8Ms. Um, they, ARM defined a document. If you haven't seen this document, you can freely download it. Uh, it's called the Procedure Core Standard for the ARM architecture. And all where possible, actually use registers in preference to using the stack. So the stack usage is much lower on an ARM than typically on, say, an Intel. Um, and again, this Intel has changed this model quite a lot as well. I won't go into the detail here. This is covered um, um, if you look at uh, blog.freebus.cost, there's quite an extensive blog posting about how this works for the ARM architecture. But it's being aware that sometimes these values may not go on the stack, they may actually get passed in registers. Uh, for example, the link register R14 on the ARM actually is used to, return, to store the return addresses as well. So on certain ARM, you see very, very little use of, of the stack itself in our system. Now, static storage uh, duration. Um, so, so the final bit of static, we had file scope. So st int at the top of this C file is a, uh, we know that's a static. So we said the, the memory of that is allocated while the program is running. Uh, if you have a block scoped variable, so here we have st local, but apply the static keyword to it, then this is moved from the automatic memory space to the static memory space. This means its memory is allocated once and persists for the duration of the program as if it was a file based variable. So this means it retains its value from call to call. So each time a func is called, the, uh, the last value st local is, is retained. The assignment statement equals 100 is only, is only executed the first time a func is called in the memory system, so in the execution model. So the first time a func is called, st local be initialized to 100, but also on subsequent calls, it's been incremented. So at the end of the program, whatever the value of st local is greater than 100 would indicate the number of times a func was called as an example. So that now gives us uh, a number of different, oh, sorry, final one we need to talk about is what are called allocated objects. Uh, so sometimes these are called, uh, people may call these dynamic objects. And it's probably a mistake. Both the stack-based variables and these variables, uh, these program objects are both dynamic because their memory, the actual address of them is not known to runtime. So allocated objects are where we're using the allocation model in C, uh, the default ones being malloc and free. So malloc actually requests allocation of memory. Uh, free then releases that memory. What makes allocated memory, this, this particular memory model different, is it's the only one where as a programmer, we actually control the lifetime of that memory. So as we said, for statics, the static exists for the, while the program is running. So they, it's, it's available for main starts and from till main ends. For automatics, for locals, then it's uh, from their point of definition. So the int star p, for example, is the automatic till the end of the block. But here we can see that we call create, that does the malloc. That is where the memory is actually allocated. So it's lifetime starts. And that lifetime will persist until we call the function destroy. And at that point, point the free function would, would release that particular memory. And actually I've noticed a mistake on the slide, free is a function, so there should be parameters. Uh, so it should be rounded brackets around that PTR. Apologize for that. Uh, that's a typo of my point. So that now gives us our three different types of program objects, automatic, allocated, and static. And automatic is where there, there is a keyword in C called auto, and that's where automatic is a redundant uh, keyword and really should be deprecated. Um, but that's where the keyword auto comes from. There is actually another keyword called register again, which is redundant uh, for a similar model. So the general terms we use in C programming are these three memory regions. We talk about the, the stack, the heap, and the static. 
So all automatics typically allocated off the stack if they're not coming from registers, all allocated memory is coming from the heap, and all statics go into this region referred to as stat the static region as well within our program. So there are three mains. Now the question is, what is the state of the memory when we create these objects, when, there's, when the lifetime of these objects is first created? So here we've got our three different object types. We've got our static one with global, uh, we've got local and PTR, so both local and PTR automatics, and then we've got the allocated memory, the malloc memory that's being stored on PTR. And again, I've made the mistake with free again. Um, so if we do a printf here, we're printing off the values of global, local, and the contents of what's being pointed to. Now for a local, for the automatic and the allocated objects, the values we'll see there will be complete garbage and random. Um, and it just will happen to be whatever the SRAM and last values were or the parent values are. However, a lot, a lot of people don't appreciate that for a global object, uh, so int global here, then this has a known value. So if a global value is not initialized, then it's actually by the runtime system initialized to zero. We'll actually see this. Uh, we'll see how this is done slightly later. Um, so this is actually within the standard. If you look in the standard 6.9.2, you'll see it actually refer to this, that it becomes an, a zero initialized value. Uh, and again, that is defined by the standard. If that is not happening, then your runtime system is not compliant with the expectation of the standard within that. In our memory section, because we now have, for our statics, we have what we call value initialized statics and zero initialized statics, then the static region is typically referred to under two different memory types. Um, so instead of just calling them, so generically we call them statics, but actually from a programming, you'll see this in C when people are talking about C, quite often they'll talk about dot data and dot VSS. Now these actual names are specific to your tool chain. So if, uh, and these names here come from GCC and then the most common names used. However, if you're using other tool chains, for example, IR or Kyle or, or other various ones out there, they may not be these names. They will, they will have specific names for these regions, but they may not be called uh, data or BSS. So for example, certainly IR used to call the dot data section I data and the dot BSX section dot Z data for zero data. So check your compiler manual, it'll explain uh, if you look in the linker, linker part of the documentation, it should explain what these region names are. And the key thing about this is for the dot data region, the dot BSS region, then we know the size of those at link time. So this is across all of our dot C files and our library files. We accumulate those together and we know what they are. So they all have fixed addresses and we can actually find out what these particular uh, addresses are. Uh, .bss is really weird. It's a uh, strange name. It's a historic name. I believe it dates back, back to sort of the, the time of the PDP-8, uh, PDP et cetera. And it actually stands for block started by symbol. It's an old, it's an old assembler instruction. Uh, it's one of these things that dates back to sixes and we just it, take it for granted. So, uh, but hopefully won't be an interview question. So now if we look at our, our bit of C program here, we can see we have these set of memory sections. Uh, we have our stack heap data BSS. The other two we need to be aware of, first is quite often called dot tech, sometimes called good dot program. And this is where our code lives. So we have two functions here. We have main and func x. The actual assembler, the code generated for those will go in that region. Uh, the dot text region. So again, they get concatenated together and we have a single dot text region within that. The final one created quite often called RO data, maybe called dot const. This is for our literals. In our case here, uh, we've got string literals. So file based string, this is a string, hello world. Uh, and even the string for the printf, they have to persist, they have to exist. And those literal strings tend to go in the separate region called RO data. Sometimes they may be included in the dot text. So some tool chains will put them directly within the dot text and won't separate them out. But most modern compilers will separate them out into a separate region. Now, interestingly, is the constant const value equals 100. Um, with modern C, 
generally that value will be optimized away so it won't generate any memory the only reason that that value may be generated we actually will assign memory for it is one of two regions either its address is taken at some point so the address of comps value is used somewhere in the program so then it needs an address so it will create a physical address for that in the dot ro data section uh, the other region is if we uh, have that constant value and make it available as an extern across our program so this is a good benefit for using the static directive with cons because that has a greater opportunity to optimize that memory away within our system so it's good practice to make any file based cons static as well if they're not used outside of that file and that will allow the compiler to do further optimization and, and guarantee to eliminate those from the program system ourselves so now we have our set of sections uh, within our program so if we look at the build process that we're working through, uh, we start with our set of C files and our header files. So we have a set of user header files and probably some library header files. Those combine, so a single C file with all its header files is called a translation unit. The compiler then goes through the, the pre-processing stage and a number of stages and will generate a .o file or a relocated object file within that. Now that has those particular, it has the core sections defined within it. So it'll have the uh, .text section, the uh, .ro section, and it also will know the required size of the BSS and the data the statics. What it doesn't know and can't know is the heap requirement and the stack requirement because they are runtime requirements. So that's actually contained within the .o file. Once we have all our .o files, we go through a linker stage. So the benefits, the compilation stage can actually be done in parallel. So most modern build like the make systems, you can normally compile multiple files at the same time. However, the link stage is generally a serial stage and it's the slowest part of our build. We have a set of object files. We'll have our library files quite often in a, some sort of archive, a .a file. These are typically compressed object files. Now, most important, what differs in an embedded, in a deeply embedded application from, say, a host application is we have a specific file called a control file. This is sometimes called a linker script file. And this file, very importantly, will tell the linker about our memory system, our physical memory system. It'll have directives in there to define where the flash exists from a uh, the absolute address of the flash and how big the flash is and the absolute address of the, the RAM system and those addresses. Because we may have multiple banks of flash and multiple banks of RAM. In a simple case, let's assume we've got one bank of flash and one bank of RAM. As part of that control file, we tell the linker how to map which of those sections are .bss or .txt to which parts of the memory system. So through that file, we'll typically say, put the uh, text six system into flash, put the, the statics, the BSS and data into RAM and our system. Now, most important, that file can generate something called a map file. It doesn't do it by default, but there's always a directive. And I always recommend you do this is generate something called a map file. And what the map file will then give you is a huge amount of some really useful information of every absolute address for your program or for your program image. So it will tell you the address of every function. It will tell you the address of all those constants, the .ro data. But also very importantly, it will tell you the addresses of all of the data as well. Uh, and done well, this and actually can generate, you can get the generated link to generate link errors if you exceed the available memory as an example. So do generate your link, your map file. It's initially quite hard to read. You start to get a feel for it. It's specific to your tool chain. So the map file for GCC is different to the map file for IR, for example. But I do recommend as an embedded program, you do get to understand what that file is telling you within it. Out of link file, we'll get some sort of image. So ELF is the most commonly and executable link format. Um, and finally, we have some sort of converter that will convert that into a raw binary image that we're going to put on our target system. So you'll have some sort of object object file converter. Normally, it's part of the tool chain. That is the final stage that will convert that to our raw binary image. Once we have our raw binary image, we need to get that and load that into Flash. A number of different ways this is achieved. Uh, most common is using some sort of JTAG connection. Uh, there may be an embedded uh, Flash tool located within the core that allows you to write flash for example over a serial port and obviously more extensive models will use things like over the air updates where you may even be able to modify the flash uh, over something like you know wireless or can or, or usb uh, as an example 
But we get our binary image, and that binary image has to exist in our persistent memory, in our flash memory or within our system. So now we look at the startup code, the power up code. So what happens at startup? So as part of our C application, we need a common model here. We're going to power up and each processor will have a particular model. It has to go to a well-known location. Um, most commonly, that location is zero, uh, as an example, but it can normally be another high location uh, within memory, but it will always be in the memory system somewhere. Um, zero is the most common, and actually many systems will actually remap flash to zero at boot. The flash won't actually be at zero, but as part of the boot process, the hardware will remap it to zero for purely for startup. At that point, the program, the, the processor needs to know where does my program start? How do my program start? Two models here. One model is there the address of the start code is actually stored at, for example, address zero. That was done on, for example, the, the Renesis SH2s. Or it may be at, for example, the Cortex-M system, it's actually at address four in that. Uh, other processes, if you look at, for example, the ARM7 or the Cortex, uh, sorry, the, the uh, Cortex R family, then it expects a an opcode at address zero, and it will actually execute that opcode. So it loads a program count with zero, and then that jumps to memory. Uh, so we have this starter routine. The starter routine then has to do a set of predefined behavior before we get to main. And again, this basic pattern is common of all C programs within our system. Uh, in our system. So the first thing we, we typically want to do is set up a stack pointer. So once we have a stack pointer, we can start running in C. Again, the stack pointer may be set up using assembler opcodes. There may be an opcode to actually define that stack pointer, uh, but more modern processors. So again, take the Cortex M uh, as an example. The stack pointer address is actually stored in flash. And on the Cortex M, it's actually stored at address zero. So it is a 32 bit value. So at address zero, there is a stack pointer and address four is the initial program counter uh, within our things. So that allows us to vector straight into C code. So we set up the stack pointer, the first thing we're gonna do. Now, one model you can do here and a very useful thing is that before we set up stack pointer if possible, is we pre-fill the stack with a known pattern. Uh, there's many different, different patterns out there. One of the common ones is actually a hex value, which is a human readable value called dead beef. Uh, there's loads of other different ones out there. The reason for pre-filling the stack, it allows you to do during testing where you're doing things like soap testing is to do stack depth analysis. Because what you can do is post analysis of the stack and see how much of that stack region still has that original value left in it, the dead beef, for example. So we, we talk about this concept of tide, like a tide mark. So we can then analyze how much, what percentage of our stack during that particular set of tests we use. And we can then look at a risk analysis, how close to the end of stack did we get, get within our particular system. Once we set up our stack pointer, um, we then need to initialize this BSS section because on power up, that RAM is going to be in an indeterminate flat state. The values within RAM will be in an indeterminate state. So as part of our boot process, we need a little bit of code. And this is written quite often as a little C routine. It may again be written in assembler. And it all is a very tight loop that will take a couple of addresses. It will know based on the linker. So the linker will predefine some well-defined symbols. So in that linker control file I mentioned earlier, it will the linker control file can actually define symbols and actually populate those symbols as part of the link process. So again, the names here are actually within that linker control file. There'll be a typically symbol to indicate the start of the BSS. So it may be underscore BS, underscore SBSS or BSS begin and the end of BSS. So we might see EBSS. Sometimes you may see a size as well, rather than a begin and end. So using those symbols, what we can do is we can set up a pointer, typically I say a 32 bit pointer, uh, looking at S data. Uh, we do further checks to check it's all on 32 bit boundaries now if we're running on an ARM. And then while we're not, while we're less than the end data, um, we simply can write zero to that particular memory. So, so we, we iterate that while like little tight while loop, writing zero to that particular memory. So that's how your global variables actually get initialized to zero before main starts. Is there is a little bit of code in the boot process that is just zeroing that RAM. But appreciate that takes time. So we, so we look at the time to get to main, which is a, in many embedded systems is quite an important thing. It's when our, our 
application or user application can start running, then the more global objects you have, the longer it's going to take to get to name. So if you have very large arrays, as an example, zero to raise, they actually have to go through and do, do zero initialization within our program. So once our BSS is set up, we then need to set up the data section. Now, the important thing about data section, remember, this is where we have our initialized global objects. As part of this process, we introduce a new data section. Uh, on GCC, it's called iData. Again, it may have a different name for your tool chain. Now, this resides in the flash image. It's actually part of the flash, flash image. And what happens as part of the boot process is there is a copy. We sometimes call this a shadow data. Now, because obviously the global variables have to be in read write memory, they have to be in RAM, but they need this initial value. So simply what we have is equivalent to like a mem copy, a memory copy. And again, there'll be another routine that will copy from a well-known flash location to this RAM location. So as part of the compilation of link process, any initialized values you have used. So if you've said, you know, int global variable equals 10, that 10 has to be, that will exist in the flash image. That, that, that actual literal value 10 will be part of your flash image. And as part of the root, root press, again, here you can see it'll be a simple routine again. The difference here is copying from our flash region to our RAM region. And of course, reading from flash is relatively slow compared to reading, reading from RAM, to writing to RAM. So the flash read is going to be our bottleneck here in terms of our boot process. Um, and of course, the more initialized global variables you have, the larger that I data section is going to be and the larger your flash image is going to be. And that can have a knock on effect to things like over the air updates uh, in our particular system, the time and persist to do that, those over the air updates within that. One question to ask, and then this is again going to be dependent on your compiler, is if I say int value equals zero. Because um, if I just say int value semicolon, we know that's an uninitialized or a zero initialized static. If I say int value is equal zero, it, will that be considered by the compiler as a zero initialized static or an initialized static. And of course that will affect whether the value gets placed in the data section or the BSS section. So what you may find is actually saying int value equals zero is sort of counterintuitive. It can be inefficient because you end up with zero going in the I data because the value gets placed in the data section. So you end up filling the I data with loads of zeros where if you'd only said int value semicolon, it would be zeroed anyway uh, with that. Same goes for that int array. So there we've got a, an array of, a, a, you know, we've got a 4K array. Uh, in, you know, we've got a, a K of ints, assuming int is four bytes. That's zero initialized. So again, is your compiler going to put that array object in the BSS or the data? So again, it's worth being aware of these things because it helps uh, A, reduce the, the size of the image, and also in, improve the boot time. Because if I should say int array 1024 semicolon, that will go in the BSS and it will be just zero initialized as we saw in the previous slide, which will be quicker than copying zeros, you know, 4K of zeros from flash to RAM in our big system. Now, again, even if I say int array 1024, you might find uh, equals zero, you might find your particular compiler may put that in the BSS. It may be smart enough to say, actually i want to put that, that that's better in, in the bss section so do understand again your compiler and that may change depending on the optimization level you set at compilation so you may see a difference between debug and release build as well so there we see the copy uh, going from one to the other finally if we're using the allocated memory model now again most uh, we'll, we'll see later why most embedded standards ban the use of, of malloc. Um, but if we are using that, we need a further region. We need the, the heap region. And as part of the boot process, the runtime library will need to be aware of the starting point of the heap. So again, through the link control file, it will normally define a symbol, which is the beginning of the heap. And this is normally the next address directly by default is the next address after the statics. So from the memory system, it's the next highest address after the data. That's the default. And we can change that through the configuration file within that. 
So where can our problems, why, when we've got the runtime system, we've got our program running, once we've got all the initialization done, where can our, our errors creep in, our problems creep in? So from an analysis perspective, we, sometimes you may hear the term a DU path. So DU comes from defined used path. And this is used a lot by your static analysis tools. So your compiler and your linters, for example. So all program objects should go and actually must go through this particular path. They must be defined, initialized, used, and then destroyed. And that's that's true of whether they are static, allocated, or automatics. So if we look at the normal usage of data, uh, so here we have global, that's our static, we have P, that's our automatic, and we have malloc generating allocated memory. And in each case are being correctly used. So our the benefit of our statics is they guaranteed be defined and initialized. So you cannot have, using the normal standard, an uninitialized global. Now, some most embedded tool chains do actually have an extension to the, to the C standard that have the concept of what's called a no init. And no init is a directive you can apply through either like a pragma or an attribute directive where you can actually say to the compiler, I, I want to take the risk that this global actually isn't either zero initialized or value initialized. Now, that's a non-standard thing, uh, but it can bring benefits. But you have to be very careful of that because obviously you're now using the equivalent of a dialect of C, uh, not standard C. And that can have a knock-on effect to things like portability of code and may even have a knock-on effect based on later versions of the same tool chain as well. So do be careful, but do look at the concept of no init data. We saw with our automatics and with our allocated memory that the initial values of those are undefined. So, so part of our programming model is we must do the initialization. So we see where we say P equals malloc in that. So P is, in, is it defined uh, first, then initialized. And again, we could have simplified this, but this is just to be explicit. Um, if P, we're now using P. So now P has satisfied the used model because we're reading it. Uh, then we're saying star p, that means it's being written to. So now uh, we're initializing that memory and using it at the same time. Um, we Sorry, then we use it on the next day. Star p, we're reading it. So again, we can differentiate between the write and the read. The free destroys the automatic, that releases it. The end of the block will free the memory for the p. And then, of course, when main ends, we would free the memory for conceptually can free the memory for static. So that's a correct usage going through that DU path. So there are a number of problems we can of different severity. So here's a very simple one. We have a, an automatic, so int x equal 10. We've uh, defined it, we've initialized it. So again, notice int x equals 10 is different to int x and then x equals 10. Uh, they, they're classed from a semantic model slightly differently in that, that model, but they, they achieve the same thing. Now, in this case, we never read X. So you'll find that with a typical modern compilers, if you're applying the warning directives at compilation time, you'd normally here get a warning of like an unused variable. It's the most common name for this. Now, it's not going to cause a programming object per se, but of course, it's bad practice. It's poor practice. It's not you know, from, a, from a code quality perspective because A, we're wasting memory, we're wasting RAM. That takes time. It actually takes power as well. Every time we allocate and deallocate, if it's register based, we, we're less worried about that. Um, but it can have a knock on effect to things like maintenance as well. So very easy to do, but really is poor practice. So if you see these warnings, just get rid of those local variables and don't just comment them out. They do need to be actually removed from the program code itself within that. So that's a simple example of not following the DU path. We call that the you know, unused variable, the defined destroyed model. More subtle problem and one that can cause real issues in, and they, they can be quite challenging to find is if we use a, a locally defined value, so an automatic or an allocated without it having been initialized. Um, so the Z here is the more obvious one. So we've done int Z, we've, we've defined Z as a local, it takes some random values, and then we've used it in the equation. We've used it as a plus Z. And of course, Z has just some bizarre random value here. And so that means that the, the uh, plus equals, the actual plus is going to generate a consistent but garbage result associated with it. There's another small subtle one. So 
a common idiom is that we we um, we can abuse point notation to approximate to arrays. So when we say malloc uh, n size of int is the, is a typical way of doing a dynamic allocation of an array. Uh, so where n is meant to represent the size of an array, and then we can use the array notation with pointers to index into that memory. The subtle problem here is, of course, that with malloc, that memory, again, is, is non-initialized. So the first assignment, p0, equal, p0i plus e, uses, it's using a plus equal, means that the values are uninitialized. That we, we're taking the initial value zero and then adding that to zero as well. So we're going to, whatever the result is, as well as z, we're going to get double garbage associated with it. A lot of people on a work don't appreciate there is actually an alternative to malloc called calloc. Slightly different syntax, but if you use calloc, the benefit of calloc is the memory is automatically zero. So it's slower than malloc, but you do get a guarantee of zero initialized allocated memory. So for a better style, I rarely, rarely see it used, but as better style, do look at calloc in preference to malloc, especially where you're doing an array type notation within that. Um, memory leaks, um, probably the most common issue from C, from a C project. If you look across the history of C, and you look at the reported bugs in C, um, then the memory leak is the biggest reported, and still to date is the biggest reported leak. It can, uh, there was a re recent report by Microsoft, and this can account to up to 70% of, of still modern common C programming errors, is some form of memory related and the leak being common. So the typical one here is where we've done a malloc and some part of the program. And again, this is more obvious because it's in the same function, but we saw of course malloc and free may be across the functions. And at least here I've got the free direct, free call correct. Um, we've got an if statement. And in that we, of course, if, if X happens to be greater than 1024, we wouldn't call the if. Now it looks very obvious here, but of course, if our functions are quite large in size, which ideally they're not, but, but typically they are, then of course, when we leave the function, the automatic P is destroyed. So the, the known address of that allocated memory is destroyed. And therefore we have no ability to free that memory. So very importantly, C has this, has no concept of garbage collection. So languages that like the the, uh, the Javas and the Pythons, these higher level languages that use the, the concept of abstract virtual machines do garbage collection. But that has a major knock on effect of performance. And I won't get into that in this particular talk at the moment. In C, we don't have garbage collection. We, we have a fixed amount of memory. And once that, you know, we, once we've leaked that memory, we have no way of getting that leaked memory back. Um, and you may think, think this is, you know, even within a function is something that wouldn't happen. Um, even very recently, uh, people may have heard of a tool called Wireshark, very nice tool called Wireshark for analyzing things like IP packets on a network. Uh, only last year was a series of serious bugs reported, and a majority of those were simple bugs like this within a single function where there was like either an if sweep statement or a switch statement where the, the, the particular path being taken wasn't freeing up memory associated with that. Um, so that's typically called a memory leak. From a DU path perspective, it's called a never destroyed model. Um, and again, many static analyzers, will, your, your linting type tools, your PC lints or your QACs or LDRAs will normally or may be able to capture those paths and actually warn you that you may have a leak. Sometimes the leaks are a little bit more subtle. So here's an example of one that was more subtle as a bug. Um, we've allocated an array. Remember, array itself is an automatic object. It exists on the stack. It's got int star star, which may frighten you, but really it's, a, it's, it's what we're saying. An array is going to be used as a pointer to integer pointers. So we've got two levels of indirection here. We've used the malicus before. We've got array sizes. Keep it small. We've only got four. Uh, so it's allocated four elements um, times size of int star. So it's an array of four pointers. And we then populate that. So we've got another loop where we're setting each of those of the array, so array zero through array three, to point at further dynamically allocated memory. And they're individually allocated. And I've simply used int here to keep it very simple. Of course, these would normally be some sort of structure type within that. We get to the bottom and we've done free array. Now, importantly, of course, the free array here is going to deallocate the memory 
that array is pointing at. But that only is that first four pointer values. So the memory it is pointing at hasn't been deallocated. So we're not leaking the array memory, we're leaking the memory that it's then pointing at. So much more subtle and much harder to spot uh, when you're trying to do, you know, trying to track down bugs and you're trying to do analysis of this. So we would need a separate iteration, a separate for loop before the free array that freed the individual elements of array to make this code correct. Used after free, so it's called destroyed used problem. Uh, here we've allocated the memory and the code, we freed it. Um, but then further down later after the free, there happens to be a bit of code, and this may be left over through legacy or whatever, that we then use, we deallocate that pointer. And the problem with free in the C is that it doesn't zero the pointer, it can't through the, the, the oops, sorry, through, through the definition, um, apologies about that. Uh, through the definition on the left hand side. So if you start P now, what's going to happen at this point? Uh, this is quite often called a dangling pointer problem. So used after free, destroyed, use, but also dangling pointer. So when we say star P equals 100, it's going to try and write 100 to that memory on the heap. If you're running on a hosted system, for example, in Linux, um, you'd normally get a program exception at that point. So you, you typically find the program will terminate in a core dump. And in, say, in Windows, you might get some dialogue, some, stack, some heap frame dialogue. In the embedded system, where the heap managers are much, much simpler, then that may be a transparent problem, that that star p equals 100 would happily write 100 to that memory. And if you did the printf, you would see 100 printed back. But of course, what may have happened is that memory may have been reallocated to another pointer. And that, as you can guess, leads to a, a nightmare scenario in terms of trying to track down the bug problems. And you end up having to get down to hardware memory access breakpoints to try and work out where this, why and when this memory is being allocated within that. On the right hand side, we have some other um, used after free, sort of really horrible examples of code. Uh, and all these have existed in code bases. You look at and go, you'll never write code like this. I assure you, these all exist in, in, in code bases. Uh, so the first one is where we have a static object as a pointer, so global pointer at the top. So its memory member persists for the program, but we've done the horrible thing of storing the address of an automatic in that global pointer. When func a returns, then of course the memory, the stack-based memory for local is, is retrieved. So the stack is, is popping and it means of course that memory now that stack memory may be for a local in another function and that's again as you can imagine because that global pointer persists if we write to it we're going to corrupt that memory within that uh, same goes for function b that we've got a return value of an int pointer so the address of an integer and we return the address of a local uh, within that so th there we have undefined behavior within that and what actually happens it, you know, who knows? Uh, something will happen, uh, but you need to understand your runtime system. So again, the hosted system, they would normally be caught because they're quite often using something called a memory management unit and virtual memory. But in the deeply embedded space, we don't have that luxury. So these are quite often silent problems that will manifest themselves later on in the program. So that's why they're so difficult because when the bug surfaces, when we get the crash or we get the problem, the code crushing may be a, a long way away from a program execution perspective from the piece of code that actually caused the problem in the first place. And these can take days and days and days to track down within our particular system. Double free, uh, again, another weird one. Uh, what happens if I free the memory and free the memory again? This will be down to your C library. So again, on a hosted system, Linux, for example, standard C library, this would normally be captured. So again, you'll get some sort of program error, major error that is trying to free previously freed memory. On the embedded system, deeply embedded library, it again may not be caught that you do a double free. And the problem with the double free is that it is telling the, the memory management system, you know, tag this memory as available for reallocation. Now, what may have happened between the two frees is that a different pointer may have allocated that memory. So we've done a malloc to a different pointer, which still believes it's in that memory. And the free has released it. And of course, the sizes may also be different. 
So you can get some really weird behavior going on with a double free going on. And ultimately it may crash the system. It may, it certainly will corrupt the system in many, many ways within our clinical system. Also, once we have any form of dynamic memory, so in that I include both stack and heap as dynamic memory. The, the, the addresses of the individual program objects cannot be known until the program is executed. So the stack based ones, so the child password here, uh, in both cases, the actual memory being stored uh, on the left hand side, we've got password as an as a automatic. So those 12 uh, bytes are going to be on the stack. Um, dangerous piece of code, get string. So password, we pass the address of password. Remember the address of an, an array is always, the, the name of an array is always an address. So get S is get string. So if we supplied more than 12 bytes, uh, in, remember including the null, uh, null uh, pointer, uh, so the, the null character at the end of the string, then we can actually corrupt the memory beyond password within that. Um, and the way it's done will vary from uh, compiling in the way string, uh, so the get s works. This is historically has been used as a common exploitation model where you try and deliberately corrupt the stack frame. Now the stack frame will sit higher in the stack than password by definition. And you try and either accidentally or deliberately corrupt that return address. So if you end up corrupting that return address, when is password OK returns, then it's going to return to some random address. So again, it, it can be that may cause something like a bus error because the address you've actually corrupted it with exists, doesn't exist in the actual physical address space. So you get so if it doesn't exist in either RAM or flash, you will typically get a, a hardware bus error. Um, but of course, a finely crafted exploit would actually get that code, that a return address to, to jump to a well-known uh, function like open the lock uh, as an example. So that's why we need to be very careful of what's called stack underflow or overflow. Same goes for the heap. So that can be exploited as well. So the malloc here, the actual memory for password uh, is coming from the heap. That string is now going to be written in the heap, but we can corrupt the heap as well, uh, both before and after the allocated memory. And that can cause weird problems. Also, again, can be exploited to try and read that memory above and beyond the allocated memory as well. So both of those can cause serious memory problems. The way the problem may you may see the problem will depend on the way your runtime system in your linker system, especially your linker control file, is allocating the stack in the heap. And there are actually two models out there. Uh, the left hand model is the generic model, the more traditional C model. And the way this works is we have our available read write memory. We think of a RAM. The BSS and the data are fixed, so we know how big these are. Um, and the boot system most commonly will set the stack pointer to the highest address in RAM. So it starts at the top RAM because our stack will normally grow towards low memory. So the heap pointer is then, as I mentioned earlier, put as the next free address after the data section or after the stack looks within that. And the way the runtime system works there, the C runtime library, the C runtime system is that heap will grow toward, will grow up, stack will grow down. And of course, we hope they never meet. Uh, should they meet, the runtime system would detect they met the stack pointer and the, the available heap, uh, the non-allocated heap now clash. And that's when your malloc would return zero. Um, and, and the problem there, if, if the stack is coming down, you need the runtime system to be able to report that you've had a stack overflow. Otherwise, it would just corrupt that memory below it. Most embedded systems will not detect stack overflow in that case. They will normally detect heap overflow because, or heap, heap exhaustion because malloc will return zero. But the stack overflow, the, the exception stack. So you'll find most embedded cross compilers allow for what's called a dual region. And the dual region as part of link configuration file is the stack and the heap sizes are actually configured as part of link configuration file. So as part of your linker script, you will predefine how big you want the heap to be and how big you want the stack to be. The benefit of this model is at link time, the compiler, the linker can work out that based on your required stack size, your required heap size and the known statics, whether there is enough RAM available within that model. And if there isn't, it will report at link time of things like it will typically see a message along the lines of a region overflow. Uh, 
Um, this actually also allows us to move the heap and stack around in that memory. It doesn't have to be as it's viewed on the right there. So for example, we could move the stack below the statics in memory. Now, again, I haven't got the time really to get into that way, but it is a model for, for defensive setup of the RAM system is moving that around. So again, uh, some, some systems allow for both, uh, but I would always favor the dual region. So again, understand your linker system and your linker script and prefer, because then we have the potential um, we may be able to use something like a memory protection unit. So the Cortex-M family have an optional thing called the memory protection unit, and that allows us to uh, inhibit access to certain regions of RAM and actually detect those through runtime exceptions. So you can set the MPU up so that if you try and access outside of those regions, you would generate a hardware exception within that. So again, understand your MPU for doing that. Interestingly, on the Cortex V8, MV8 architecture, the latest for iteration of the Cortex M is they've introduced something called a stack limiting register. And what that means is you can put up the you can put the bottom of stack in this register. If your stack point then meets this, it will generate a program exception within that. And other architectures that support that concept as well within that. Final thing to look at is to do with multitasking. So if we're using a real-time operating system, we have our standard processor, so program counter states register stack pointer and our set of scratch registers. What is typically happening when we move from task to task, thread to thread, I'll use those interchangeably for now, then all that's happening in the background is the real-time operating system is equivalently taking a snapshot of that, what we call the context, the processor context. So somewhere in memory to storing those values away. The easiest way it does that is actually by pushing all of those registers, except the stack pointer onto the stack, so program counter SR and Rs, and then saving the stack pointer away. And then simply having a separate stack point, uh, stack, stack pointer that for the, uh, uh, for the other memory, sorry, my, my animation has, got, has gone wrong, for, the, for a new stack and load that in. That means that each, um, there, the animation is now showing. Sorry, PowerPoint had a moment there. Uh, where each stack, um, we simply have one stack pointer per task, and then we pop off, for example, the display pass values here. This means for real time operating systems, for the majority of modern real time operating systems, and actually for any threaded system, including Windows and Linux, every thread has its own stack. So that means from going back, the final thing for our memory system is that. Rather than having just one stack, we now need a stack per task. How those stacks for the individual tasks are allocated, so main will have its own stack, there will always be the main stack as for our main routine. But then for each task you have, it needs its own stack. And there are two models you'll see with RTOSs. The left-hand one is where the RTOS allocates. So you simply say, I want a stack of this size for this task, you know, half a K or whatever. And it will commonly go to the heap to allocate that memory. So that, that RTOS requires you must have dynamic memory. However, the right the, on the right hand one, a lot of operating systems, you have to pass to the operating system, the API call where you create the task, the address of the stack to use. And most commonly that means we can allocate that memory. Now we could allocate it from the heap, but quite often we'll allocate that in static memory and then pass the address of that as an array, simple array, of say you and Tate's and pass those addresses to the RTOS within that. Whatever you do is don't allocate task stacks on the main stack, that will go horribly wrong. Now the API I've shown at the bottom there is from free RTOS, the latest iteration of free RTOS allows you to do either. Historically free RTOS was purely the right, the left hand one, the, uh, the uh, RTOS allocates model. Five, wrapping up, the last things you may not be aware of are VLAs. In C99, uh, the, the, the C99 standard introduced the concept of variable length arrays. This is where historically in C90, all arrays have to be compile time sized. So you couldn't have a dynamically sized array. But C99 now allows for automatics to be arrays. So here we can see that the size of this, this the allocated object path is has to be compile time calculated. Uh, now, there is a, typically an upper size, so the maximum size this can be uh, in our program. Unfortunately, the standard doesn't define where the memory for VLAs is allocated from. It's down to the runtime, the compiler and the runtime system. 
The majority of modern compilers and certainly embedded compilers tend to use the stack. They tend to treat it as an automatic, but some do use a heap. So they will actually, depending on the size, so for larger allocations, they may, for smaller allocations, they will use the stack. For larger allocations, they will use the heap. So again, you need to appreciate this model. And for that reason, many embedded code in standards ban VLAs. So MISRA, for example, MISRA 2012 bans uh, variable length arrays in our system. So as an advice when programming for memory systems, understanding your, the memory model in C is actually very, very straightforward and very well defined within the system uh, and the way the system boots. So importantly, when we're using because of the memory model, that it's a very clear, but obviously because we don't have virtual memory, not using garbage collection, as embedded programmers, we have to be very careful of that use of memory. You need a good coding standard, um, and that should have rules regarding allocated memory. So using the use of malloc and free as an example, and it should have guidelines around the use of VLA. MISRA C is still the best embedded coding standard out there as a starting point. Now you may want to relax it, it may be more, restraining than you'd need. But I would say start with MISRA and relax it rather than trying to create your own within that. Um, and MISRA bans both the use of things like malloc and VLAs within it. I implore you to use a static analysis tool. Uh, there, are, there are commercial tools, there are free open source tools, but use, don't, first is turn your compiler warnings up. So use all the compiler warnings that, as you can, warnings all, warnings errors, and make sure you set the flag where warnings are treated as errors. Yeah, start with that. It's hard to retrofit that, but if you're on a new system or writing any code yourself, always treat warnings as errors because they are in that. Now, most static analysis tools, good static analysis tools, will capture a number of those patterns of errors, define, destroy, define, use, and they will give you indications associated with that. Uh, so, yeah, do use a, a static analysis tool. There are a lot of really, really good ones out there as part of your build model. If you have it available to you, um, then if your process has memory protection, then program your memory protection unit. Make sure as a minimum, uh, you want that two region model for, for dynamic memory and use what we tend to call canaries. So canaries are where we uh, wrap, we have, have well-defined regions above and below the stack and the heap, and between the stack and the heap, that if or accessed in any way, will generate a hardware exception. And the MPU allows you to set that up. Uh, within that. And as I mentioned, the ARM V8M, the latest, the, the, the M23, the M33s, have this concept of a stack limiting register within that. Finally, understand your tool chain. Uh, there, there, there will, if you're using ARM, download the ARM document, that AAPCS. We tend to talk about the concept of the ABI, the application binary interface. This is everything that's going along under the covers. Uh, and of course, education. C is a very easy language to learn but it is difficult to master within our program. So to finish up, I just wanted to say, almost all the slides that I've gone through today come from a number of our different courses. We've been talking about these sorts of issues for the last 20 plus years.